Hello and welcome to the first in our new series, Getting to Know Your Favourite Creators. So this uh, this episode, uh, our primary and first of the series, I'm joined by none other than your favourite, ultimate YouTuber, Mr. Boomstick XL. He's been uh, he's been in the game uh, quite a little while now. Um, really uh, inspired by a lot of your other favourite YouTubers, um, some of the uh, some of those bigger names that you you would have known. Um, but he's come on leaps and bounds, and he's he's got one of the primary Xbox shows on uh, the internet now, uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to have him here this week and um, for our first episode. So, Mr. Boomstick XL, how are you doing today, brother? I am doing fine. First of all, thank you so much for not only asking me to do this new series, but being number one. Wow. I mean, I, you, you, I, that can never get taken away, right? Like, I'm the first <laughs> guest. I definitely appreciate it. I, I love giving um, people – Yeah, I hate to use the word fans because I'm so into this community. I, I honestly don't think that I'm better than anyone else. I just like to talk about games, and I've been able to transition my love of that to multiple shows. But thanks a lot for the uh, the invite. Definitely appreciate it. No, it's no problem at all, no problem. And if we're first person, as soon as I had a, a, a big list of all these people I wanted to get on, and one of the first persons I wanted to get on was one of the people that I haven't yet managed to get on the show, and that was Mr. Boomstick XL himself. We will get you on the podcast at some point. <laughs> yes, ab absolutely. We definitely will do that for sure. <laughs> uh, but before we get into uh, the the creator side of yourself, uh, I want to delve into your gaming history and, and the love of gaming and where that started. So the first question really is, and it is quite a deep question, what is it that started your love of video games in the first place? What is it that you got you into video gaming? Dude, that's that's ultra easy. Uh, back in 1978, yes, they, 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 you know, I'm that old. I'm 50, <laughs> folks. Uh, my dad uh, brought home for my brother and myself as a surprise the Atari 2600. And nice. obviously, back in the days, that, that the, the the packing game, which we don't really get anymore, uh, came with combat. He he brought home. I think he brought home. It was it was combat that we played. It was Pac Man and of course like Missile Command and Space Invaders. Yeah. Um, uh, Yars Revenge is another one that we wound up getting shortly after getting the console, and we would play for hours upon hours. And it literally, dude, no joke. From that one moment, all the way until I'm 50 years old now, the love of video games has never wavered. I have never you know, fell out of love with it because, you know, I was chasing girls or I was too cool for the joystick. It, I've been playing games since I was a kid. And, and what's crazy is that my affection for the industry uh, has, has grown over the course of 40 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, to be fair, that is exactly, exactly how it, it kind of does. And, and it's a similar, it was a similar story to myself because I uh, my first kind of gaming experience wasn't from something that I did. It was from family members. Yep. So it was the uncle. The uncle had both the the and obviously I'm not as uh, not not your generation, but the uncle. <laughs> my, my, my my father's his generation. They had all of them. Had all the Ataris. They had the cassette player, video consoles. You name it, they had it all. Um, but my first was the um, just the, the regular Super Nintendo, uh, and then the, obviously the, the regular Nintendo before that, um, and the um, Sega Mega Drive. So that was my first wow. console version uh, of games that I started playing uh, before I got my own. Um, but that's really the the backstories. It it seems to be family members getting us into yeah. these these things in the first place and i mean we're, 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 i mean you got to look at it from a from a kid's point of view like i, I wasn't going to go out at eight years old and buy the, <laughs> the <Exactly. Atari> 2600 <laughs> same same thing for you you know back in the days these consoles were expensive people forget oh, you know that when you compare uh like if you look at like the sega c uh, like like the sega cd that was a 200 dollar device yeah on, on top of having to get a genesis that's 300 bucks you, right now you get 300 you can get a series s 
it's pretty yeah. crazy. <laughs> it's it's mad how how far things have come since then. But again, I, there's, there's certain things you miss from kind of going back a few generations, including things like demo discs. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, de downloadable demos is another one. I mean, I, I know that a lot of us, including my, because I, I, I still have a love for physical media and, and like reading. Yeah. Like, I still get Game Informer. I don't get it digitally. I, I like holding a magazine. They don't make magazines like they used to anymore. Sure, you can get, you literally can get any information you want with two clicks of a mouse or a keyboard. But I miss going to the Optimo to get the, you know, the EGM and the Game Pro yep. and the Gamers Republic and Die Hard Gamer. And these, yeah, you're right. The, all of the stuff that we appreciate, a lot of these newer generations, they'll, they'll never be able to experience that. Nope. Like official Xbox magazine and yes. the original PlayStation PC Gamer. Yes. I mean, that's <laughs> still a thing, but PC Gamer back then, every week, you used to get a demo disc or he has a yeah. few. I mean, with PC, you always used to get dial-up internet trial CDs. <laughs> I, don't know about, I don't know about over in America, but it was over here. Yeah. There's some dial-up internet for you to try and you used to switch providers once a week. <laughs> yeah, the good old days. The good old days. <laughs> Showed our age, yeah. Dear me. Um, but with that in mind, the first, the first um, game console that you owned yourself obviously not one that a parent bought for you but when you started earning your own money when you started getting out and doing things the first console you went out and from your own hard-earned cash went out and bought for yourself what was that first console That, believe it or not, was the uh, Sega Master System. Right. I, I awesome. had I had gotten the uh, the uh, super uh, not the super the regular NES for my fifteenth birthday. Yeah. And of course, right around right after that, Sega released the Master System, and I, I remember going to Play World that used to be right by us on Corp City Boulevard in the Bronx. And I remember taking like my 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 allowance that I saved up. I used to deliver uh, penny savers in the tower buildings, you know, a couple times, uh, you know, a weekend. So I can and I saved up all this money, and I wound up buying it. And I, you know, I got the light gun, I got the you know the two controllers, I got the packing game. So yes, the 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 Sega Master System was my first that I actually paid for. That's awesome. That's awesome. And what was what was obviously because at, at that point, like you say, there was. Nintendo, but then Sega were really starting to drive up with with kind yeah. of how powerful they were in the gaming sector. And what was the game that convinced you at that point? Right, I need one of these. I need a Sega Master System. Shinobi, Shinobi <laughs> did because uh, back in the days, and again, this is something that you know when we when we start talking about our history, a lot of people don't understand that arcades used to be a thing. Like it yeah. was the the mecca for any anybody growing up back in the days because you know obviously home consoles were expensive most of us at, at least i can say that my, my parents used to take me to nathan's on central avenue where they used to it used to be like a nathan's hot dog place but on on the on one half of the of the store and on the other half they had like 200 arcade machines and we'd go in there and my father would say okay listen guys it's five dollars each you run over to the guy, he gives you, he puts it out to five dollars and quarters, and you went crazy. And we were in there, you know, an hour or two, because you know, we were kids, we went through those quarters like they were for free. And uh, yeah, I, I remember playing Shinobi in the arcade, and when I saw it, I was like, "Oh my god, it's I could play this at home. I don't need quarters. This is a this is crazy." And yep, that's that's I remember that playing that. A Alien Syndrome is another one. Uh, that I absolutely loved. Lo died a million times, but absolutely loved. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think one of the, as you mentioned, though, going into the kind of arcade machines, that's one of the main reasons as well that I picked up the PlayStation 1 when that first came out. As you can imagine, playing on the arcade machines, at that same point, they had Time Cop on, uh, <sighs> yeah, on the arcade so machines. Yes. Um, they also had, I'm trying to think now, I think it was the Night of the Living Dead or something like that. Oh, was, uh, was House of the version. Dead. The House of the Dead. That's yes. the one. And those two games. And of course, when the PlayStation came out, they had the, the guns and everything to go with it and Time Cop. Yep. I was like, right, that's it. <laughs> Definitely need a PlayStation. That's what I want to do. 
The gun just, games they, is something else. My God, how 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 great were light gun games back, especially in the arcade? Remember, I don't know if you remember the game. Remember when Aliens had the used to hold the pulse rifle, and yes. it was just such a big cabinet. Ah oh, man, those are the days, dude. Those are the good old days. They are. They are. It's a shame, of course. Uh, we know the Halo tried to bring it back. Yeah, um, they did. The I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm never. You know what's sad? I never played that in the uh, in uh, Dave and Buster's. I really wanted to, and I was always hoping. I mean, we'll probably never get it where they can use yeah. you know use the controller or even you know. But I would love to see that come to Xbox. What what it, what what an incredible! And I've seen tons and tons of videos of it, and it looks really good. Yeah, yeah. I think we should start a petition to bring back light I, gun games. You know what? I'll be number one sign. I'll let's sign. I'll set, let's start let's that up done. right. Let <laughs> <laughs> get that done. They were so much fun though. It's just the basic kind of the basic thing of just pointing, aim, and shooting at the screen. It hit where you wanted it to hit, and then yeah, drop the reload back up again. There we go. So good. Such fun memories of doing that. Such fun memories. Is there any specific? I mean, following following the Sega Master System, what was your road on consoles then? What consoles did you go from? Here, here's the thing. This is gonna sound I, I pompous, but, but I don't mean I don't mean to be. Yeah. Um, you know, I can honestly say with full authority that since my first experience with the uh, Atari Twenty Six Hundred, I have never missed a home console launch since nineteen seventy eight. And I know that's pretty hard to believe, but I am telling you that I beg, borrowed, and and well, I never stole, but beg, borrowed, <laughs> and traded my my toy, whatever I needed to do to get like the like, like the Coleco Vision. Yeah, people don't even know what the hell that is. I remember having it. I got a massive trade. I wound up trading some like GI Joes and some Transformers, and I wound up getting that and like twenty games and the big controllers. <laughs> and it, it was, I, I I always found a way, uh, whether that be working real hard, saving up money, you know, saving up my allowance, saving up my birthday money as a kid, trading yeah. stuff for it. I always found a way to get video game consoles. Uh, it's it's it's. It's listen. I, I don't have a lot of vices. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm not a hang out with the boys in a in a bar kind of a dude. I'm you know I, I'm very simple. My only vice is gaming. I like yeah. collectibles. I like gaming, and I I I, I, will, I will say that my favorite console of all time of of and I I don't know if we're gonna get to that, but my favorite console <laughs> still to this day yep. is the Sega Dreamcast. Yeah, I've got a lot. I've got a lot of big Sega Dreamcast guys following me. So, dude, I can see, I, I can see why. It was a I hard game. am. Uh, first of all, I have eighty six games in storage, most of which are import. If, if, if again, if you were a big fan of Dreamcast, that, then you were, had to be a big fan of SNK and Capcom, which which they led the charge yeah. in games. Especially, I used to import everything. Like currently, I have. The uh, the uh, gray one that came, um, you know, f from Japan, and yeah. I have the black one that came here, that was launched here in America. And I have two funny stories if you want me to tell them Go about about uh, uh, the, the, when the Sega Dreamcast first launched in Japan. Yeah, I, I used to import everything. I mean, and, and I and it's funny because guys at work, like I'm a retired New York City police officer. I did it for 21 years, loved every minute of it, went back to my old neighborhood and was able to, you know, sponsor kids and do all kinds of the stuff that you, you don't normally hear about with the good guys like myself who like the job because we are serving the, the people. Yeah, I used to work overtime for, uh, for, for games. Not to buy a new car, not to go on vacation to, for games. Yeah, and well, importations cost dude, so much. Dude, it's very expensive. So this is where it gets crazy. Back in the days, there used to be this import site. I, I don't even remember what it was. That was in South Carolina, and they had a Dreamcast package. It came with the memory card, an extra controller, and four games. One of which was in completely Japanese, so it was a, basically you're paying for garbage because you you can't. I I don't know. I know I don't know Japanese, so basically it was like a point and click game. I'm never I'm never going to play it. I I remember twelve hundred dollars plus shipping 
is what it costs. Wow. And I wind up getting Godzilla, which was a launch title, Pen Pen Tri- Triathlon, which was I still like that game. It's still fun, funny as hell. <laughs> And I don't remember what the what the uh, the other other game was, other because there's two games that I don't really remember. Uh, but I the, I remember working hours upon hours of overtime to get uh, to spend twelve hundred dollars on a console because I had to have it. I mean, I was like, oh my god, I'm not waiting for America. And when it came to the states, nine nine ninety nine is when it released here. I'll never forget it. Because my brother, Neo Mental, who's, who's, who's been on my show before, I've talked about, worked at Funko Land back in, uh, up in Central Avenue in Yonkers, and we just so happened to get a freaking monsoon that day where it was raining two, three inches per hour. It was ridiculous. Like It was, it was something out of a, a, out of a movie. And they had closed all the highways to go up to Yonkers. Don't you know, I found a way to take every goddamn side street to get up there to get that. And I wound up buying the entire launch lineup, which, by the way, is still one of the best launches in the history of gaming. Those are my two Dreamcast stories. (laughs) That's just, it's insane how much. But then again, I I can completely kind of uh, understand that I'm not quite the same as yourself but when and especially when Pokemon was just starting um, I got the originals for the Game Boy all in the Japanese version imported there was a shop wow. a shop near me that had them imported from Japan it was <laughs> and remember when Pokemon Crystal first came out that oh, didn't yes. come over in, to the UK for like a year or two later at least so I had Pokemon Crystal fully Japanese like the entire thing couldn't play it <laughs> at all. It was impossible. <laughs> I was like, "Well, <laughs> but you but had it, it though. You had it, and, had it. and other people didn't." So, <laughs> yeah, that was that. Was it? Just seeing it, I was like, "Right, okay. Well, I want it. I want it." It was unplayable, but I wanted it. My, my choices were just God knows what I was pressing on screen. But I... <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, it. But that uh, I would imagine at the time as well. I probably maybe he's paid seventy, eighty pounds british just to get that when yeah. it first came out that's just insane. imports people don't understand how expensive they were uh they they were 30 40 dollars more than what you'd pay here oh, yeah. no doubt i mean the import prices and the and the up and the upres on the on the pricing was bananas oh, so if you, if you if you if you you had to be a die hard gamer to be an importer yeah oh one hundred percent, one hundred percent. This late light uh, kind of goes into my uh, my next question. Uh, following your admission of your your favorite console of all time, what is your favorite franchise and or video game of all time? Do That is the easiest thing. For me, Resident Evil. Dude, when I tell you Resident Evil is such an incredible franchise and it holds such a special place for me because 96, Resident 1 comes out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was for the PlayStation. And I remember just beating it. Every, I mean, every opportunity I had to beat that game, I, I found a way to beat it. I absolutely fell in love with it, so much so that I have beaten Resident Evil 1 on just about every console it's ever been released on. And a funny story is, even right now, I, I used to, again, I used to do the massive imports. It was called Biohazard. It still is in, yes. in Japan. Yep. And I, I have the extremely rare... Sega Saturn version of Resident Evil 1, where there were two nemes- uh, um, uh, tyrants at the end. Not one. There were two. There was a special gold one that you... That, uh, uh, yeah, this is how much I'm into, this, into the franchise, dude. Like, I... Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> I, I actually still own every import copy. Even the light gun games that were terrible. I beat those as well. The only Resident Evil that I have yet to beat, and I just have tried multiple times, and it's just so freaking awful, 
is Resident 6. That is the one Resident Evil I have never finished. I got halfway through and I was like, this is awful. This is when, when you had gang members turning from, uh, from uh, Yakuza into flying creatures, I was like, you know what? They've crossed the line and now I quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit too far-fetched. Far yeah. too far-fetched. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Resident Evil to this day is still my favorite franchise of all time. Uh, in, in my top like five games, Resident 2, the, uh, 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 um, when it, 2019 yeah. actually outpaced Resident 2, 98 uh, yeah. for my 1 and 2. And, of course, Resident 3. Now, Resident 3, the remake, as great as it looks and as great as it plays, they cut so much out from that game. It, it, it's it's still in my top 10, but not in my top 5 because Resident 3, even though it was considered a side story, is still a masterpiece. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you mentioned there, of course, six. And I, I, that that never really gets a look in that game because I don't think anybody really appreciated that game or liked it anyway. Um, thankfully, seven seems to have pulled it back. And what do you make of seven and, and now the village then? Well, seven and when it was when seven released, and I believe it was 2017 is when seven came out. Uh, yeah. It was my game of the year then. Uh, it, it I, and a lot of people, and I've talked about this numerous times. People do not understand that in 2016, Capcom was on the verge of bankruptcy. Oh, yeah. They were on the ropes. Yeah. Uh, they have done. They had at that point done everything that they could with the Resident Evil series by rehashing it and re-releasing it and HDing it. And Resident Seven, literally, uh, not not solely. Because Monster Monster Hunter World was also accounts to for their big comeback in 2017. But Resident Seven is I I'm gonna be honest with you when it was announced as first person I I, I thought that the company had thrown Resident over the cliff. I was like you know what I I, I don't know if I'm gonna like this. This is first person Resident Evil. Eh, I don't know. I mean I'm used to the third person over the shoulder. Turns out that it's pretty damn good, and I'm very very excited. Uh, especially because now we're going to be chased by a nine-foot vampire woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, most definitely. So it's uh, but you're looking forward to the village anyway. This one, it seems yeah, like I, I am. Uh, you know, yeah, you know what? When I first heard about the werewolves and vampire thing, I was like, man, you know that 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 is a, a much different. That's like a like you know you're you're going down the road and instead of going right to where you need to go, you you know the car just swerves left, and you're like, what what road am I on? But to be fair, would would we be this excited about Resident Evil The Village if it was just another bunch of townsfolks that were taken over by parasites or zombies, yeah. right? So they, they eventually have to make new B.O.W.s. And I think that's what this is. I think that there's going to be some sort of connection to how these people got their, you know, their, their vampire slash, you know, werewolf powers, so yeah. it's going to be interesting, but again, I, I have faith that they're going to deliver. I, I honestly can't wait. Were you a, a, a good fan of uh, Resident Evil Four? I know they're doing a remake of that, which they've kind of pushed back a little bit. Yeah. Um, but what do you make of what do you make of the fact that the remake in Four is that was that one that you enjoyed at the time? Or I loved Resident Four. I've beaten Resident Four at least a dozen times i beat it on the gamecube i beat it on the playstation I, I i beat it everywhere i've had the chance to play it yeah. um personally i see why they want to remake it uh, i'm I, I but i'm going to be honest with you i was a bit disappointed th that they did four not because four doesn't deserve it i think four yes will will fare well with a remake but i don't think they should have went that route code veronica which was a Dreamcast exclusive when it launched, should have been the one that they... I mean, again, everyone has been calling for it. I'm, I'm not the only Resident fan no, that says no. Code Veronica uh, should be one. I know, I know that they they have... The, the, the producer, the original producer at Capcom said that they have no problem even going back and remaking one, which would be the third time. Yeah. I, I'm, I put it to this way. I think what they're doing is smart. Uh, what they uh, what they're doing is catering to the fans like myself who appreciate the remake of two and three, and yeah. also taking the series forward and and innovating on what has made Resident Evil where it came from. 
to where it is now by also, uh, you know, offering a first person different way of telling the story for other gamers. I mean, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a fan either way, but I think what they're doing is, is the right way. No, oh, most definitely. And again, you bring in a new generation of Resident Evil fans as well by doing that. There's a lot, uh, and this is just something that we're used to, but we're used to playing or be going, being able to go back and play in these old retro games that we know and love from yep. 10, 20, 30 years ago. But I think some of the new generation that kind of knows up at some of these older style games, or older looking games or games with poorer graphics and things like that, they, they kind of overlook them. Um, so if this is one way of getting them into this, into the kind of history of the franchise, that's probably the best way of doing it. Um, yeah. Probably the best way of doing it. Um, going into now your creator side. So I want to know, first and foremost, what is it that kind of enticed you to start being a creator in the first place? Obviously, your love of video games was one of them. But what is it that made you think, and like my, like myself, I had the same had the same thoughts as everyone, but we've all got our own reasons for wanting to, to do this. Um, but what was your first thoughts? And and right, okay, today I'm going to try and set up this channel. I'm going to. This is what I'm going to do. What what enticed you to get started in the first place on being a creator on on both YouTube and and on on the internet and podcasts and etc. Well, here's the thing. Uh, what where this all stems from is, I look back to 2014, uh, and I yeah. and I and I say that that, that specific year uh, simply because it is when I personally was fell out of love with the gaming industry's, um, you know, uh, media. Basically, yeah. uh, I, I I have always been a multi uh, multi plat kind of a gamer, but I've always since its inception in in, in two thousand and one have been been an Xbox you know quote unquote Xbox guy. Yeah. Um, but I I've owned every PlayStation, every PSP, I've owned every Nintendo, every uh, every Game Boy, you you name it, I've owned it, uh, and I've I've supported it equally. But like for me. Uh, 2014 is where my distaste for gaming media completely collapsed. Like I used to be the guy that would go to IGN, you know, and, and, and with Ryan McCaffrey, who was a big fan of at one point, you know, to, uh, you know, to keep to help help keep the lights on at IGN, thirty dollars a year, and we'll give you these PC games that I never freaking use. Like I'm whatever, but I was such a fan that I I, I was. I supported everyone through Patreon and, and, and different ways of, of showing my support as a fan for a lot of these places. Uh, Giant Bomb, I was a big fan of. But the old, yeah. show, the original show and the new show. Uh, big fan of, uh, still a big fan of Kind of Funny. Greg Miller, what they do over there. I, I'm a big fan of, of, of Kind of Funny games and, uh, you know, Gamer Tag Radio uh, with Danny Pena and, of course, uh, Pete Rock and, and Paris Lilly, who's a part of the X cast. You know, these, seeing seeing them do these shows, uh, I, I had never understood that there was a, 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 an audience on YouTube that talked about video games. Because when you hear, yeah. you know, gotta, you got to look at my, my age bracket at the time. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm, a mu I'm much older at the time. And, the, and the, you know, the kids, you know, YouTube for everything. And I'm like, what is this YouTube that everyone is, is talking about? So I went and looked at it. And I just typed in video games. And one of the first um, places that popped up at the time was Crossfire with yeah. Mooch. Mooch and crap. I mean, obviously, you know, people have their feeling about crap, but I, I, I'm a big fan of what Mooch does. Uh, he, you know, we don't agree a lot. We definitely don't agree a lot, and but that's fine. But I always appreciated his tenacity for yeah. you know the way he handles himself on his show. And I used to watch. So I, I, I stopped watching the IGNs, the giant bombs, the. You know, uh, the only ones I kind of hung around with was Game Informer, which I still like. And, of course, Game and Tag Radio. But there were very few. Like, I fell out of love. And I and I thought that the uh, the, the change in the media, which, which went from loving the Xbox brand to literally, literally writing every article to just basically shit on it. Uh, that's yeah. what they wanted to do. And it sold clicks. 
And I was like, well, if that's how this is going to go, then I'm, I'm not going to be a part of the support here. So, you know, I used to listen, used to listen. And in uh, 2017, uh, which is three years later, by the way, um, I, I, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm retired three years, you know, and I'm playing games and, and I'm listening to podcasts. I threw, uh, you know, listening to Crossfire, I had reached out to Mooch and said, hey, listen, Mooch. I'm a big fan of the show. Is it do do you have community members come on as a as a guest? So that it really was a bucket list check for me. That that's all I kind of really wanted was to yeah. be able to say that I was on my favorite podcast at the time. And you know what? Check. I can go and move on to something else. And he's like, Yeah, sure. You know, we we you know, let, let's try and set something up. I finally got on. And you know, literally the rest is history. Um, I, I stayed on the show for two years, and I started to want to voice my own opinion. You know, get you know, you know, start my own entity, if you will. You know, yeah. build from the ground up, double barrel gaming, and um, in in uh, I think it was August. I uh, know August, November third of twenty seventeen is my first. Welcome to Double Barrel Gaming video. And I'm going to tell you this right now. It stinks. It is <laughs> awful, dude. The sound is off. The video is off. I got video running in the background. I didn't even know how to do it. It doesn't even have a thumbnail. Like, it <laughs> a captured screen of Wolfenstein. It's awful. But why it's still up there is because it's, it's, it's clarity to yeah. remember where you come, everyone starts with one sub, you know what yep. I'm saying? And no one goes and rockets to 10, you know, 10,000, which is what I'm in the hunt for right now, or 30,000 or even a hundred thousand. You have to start with one sub. And that is really where double barrel gaming came from. It, it, it's, it's being, uh, you know, on that show, guesting on a few others. And I'm like, you know what, as much as I don't mind guesting, I think it's time for me to venture out and do my own thing. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a lot. A lot of what I was there was there was a lot of um, podcasts that I was watching, and I was it was really mine stemmed from the really the affinity and the and the chats we have when we're in game chat with friends playing on online yep. and sitting in your party chats and just talking about things, etc. And I was thinking, you know what? It's be very easy to just turn this into a podcast. We we yeah. already talk about yep. video games so much anyway. It's just a case of just sitting down one day, not actually playing those games, just sitting face to face and talking about them whilst people watch us talking about them and interacting with them. Um, but really getting, like you, much yourself, I was, um, again, years ago, when I first started watching these YouTube kind of podcasts and channels, again, the crap gamers and the mooches, uh, then the cool Eastwards and the yep. dealers, and, um, and then started to watch some of the podcasts that came around with them and then, eventually like you say last year it was just okay let's pull the trigger let's get this set up and it's well, first episode as you mentioned shocking quality didn't really know what we were doing stumbling all over words <laughs> no direction <laughs> but uh it's the start it's the start and like you say it's a it's a it's a steady grind and, and you've done really well to get where you are so far it's not uh, an absolute awesome thing and, and right now of course you're you're starting to go into actual video creation yes um as well as just podcasting now the the inspiration for your video creation what what's that been and then what's made you decide right i want to now try and kind of have a second part of my channel now i want to go into this creating video content you know believe it or not uh i like most youtubers you start yeah. out doing videos uh I, I took it to another level where i got lighting equipment and i started doing unboxings now boxings i still do it's a tremendous amount of of uh production that goes into it because you know I, I don't have a house I'm, I'm in an apartment so there's limited room so i have to go get yeah. the equipment i have to put everything up you have to set up the studio. You have to set up the umbrella lights. You got to set up the sound. So it takes a lot. So I don't do as as much unboxings as I would like. Uh, if I had a, like my own studio space, and of course I would have everything set up, so I would just go and do it and and just do the production behind the scenes. But for video, uh, recently uh, I started again, and, and you know something, uh, I was in a party chat with um, 
dealer gaming a couple of weeks ago. I say yep. maybe about a month and a half ago, maybe six weeks ago. And, uh, you know, uh, Lethal Papa was there. KY Bob was there and a few others. And uh, even Luca wound up popping in. Uh, the lovely Luca uh, popped in for a bit. And he had actually said to me, he says, you know, boom, listen, you, you, you're working real hard on your channel. And I, I'm up to four live shows a week. And that's a lot of production. Yeah. Um. And uh. I, and I. You know. At sometimes I feel like I've overextended myself, but I love doing it. So I. I just continue the grind. I, I enjoy it. And he said the only way you're going to actually grow your channel is if you start doing video. So I said to myself, Yeah. I. I hear what you're saying, Dealer Gaming, with eighty thousand plus subs. <laughs> and he kind of knows what he's talking about. Yeah. But I was like, Do Do I really want to start doing videos again? Because, listen, folks, if you don't know what goes into these videos, see, this is why, I, I, and I kind of want to just go off kilter for a second. When you message someone on YouTube, don't be a D-bag because you literally have no idea the production work that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, listen, I understand if we say something that you don't agree with, but there are certainly better ways to go about messaging us and, and, and getting us to have a conversation back. So let me let me swing the back onto the road with, with, with Dealer. W really, it wasn't the Dealer conversation that pushed me. Uh, yeah. There is a YouTuber who is a part of the Xbox Factor podcast known as Archimedes. He's from Germany. Archimedes is not only... Uh, one of, of someone I consider to be almost family. We've never met, but, you know, we, we talk all the time. It was his production into yeah. his videos that it inspired me because I had reached out to him and said, listen, I, you know, I'm using Windows Movie Maker and I'm, there's not really much to it. And I, my videos sound terrible and I don't have, I don't have, you know, transitions. I don't have to do anything. He says, listen, Go get the Moavi uh, movie uh, studio uh, maker, and I'm telling you, you're going to figure it out. So I wind up buying it, and I played with. I wind up uh, getting it the day after Christmas. I treated myself. So let me spend 108 dollars for the lifetime use of it, and I started making little videos, not not to put up, just to simply just kind of play around with, you know, to see if, yeah. if if I could figure it out. And I wind up getting the hang of it. And again, listen, folks, I, I, I'm ex-law enforcement. I know technology, but I don't know video production. I don't know <laughs> microphone level, you know, levels and transitions yeah. and stuff. I had this is all everything I did for the oh, channel is literally learning on the by the seat of my pants. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, um, watching Boxer Bear's videos and working with him every week. I was like, man, this this guy is on to something. And, and I, when I mean he is someone you should follow, you absolutely should follow this kid. Because, And I say kid, he's a little bit younger than I am. But he puts so much passion. I said, you know what? I think I can do that. And that's really what, I mean, as a dealer talking with me pushed me. But the, the inspiration really comes from Archimedes. Yeah, his, his production level is absolutely insane. And I mean, the amount of time I've obviously I've in, in chat, obviously he's one of the panel members for uh, for Midweek Mix Up as well. Yes. Um, and he's, he's, he can spend, it depends on what the topic is, but sometimes he can spend maybe six, seven hours on one video. Yes. And that's a, it's a lot of production time. Now, it's again, what, it's it, what, what it comes out to, and you know this, uh, yeah. it, it, it one hour per minute. Yeah. So if you do a seven hour video, I mean, a, a, a seven minute video, understand that the production behind that is about seven hours. That is re when you think about it. And, and I think why you have to keep grinding, even if you like for me, I, I get I sometimes get a little down. Like you do a video, you think you you think you did the greatest video of all time. Right. You, it's a it's a topic that you're passionate about. You're like, I want to talk about this in Halo. And you get 318 views, and you're like, "MF, what am I doing wrong?" But you still have to grind. You got you, yeah. you gotta keep going, and eventually you, you'll start to see it. But yeah, it's one minute, and I, and I actually learned that from Colt Eastwood because I remember Colt on RDX talking about that. People are like, "Yo, Colt, how much time do you spend?" He goes, "When I when I do a 10 minute video, it's about 15 hours." And you're like, "15 hours? That's almost half a day." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's insane. It's like you say. It's when when you start kind of looking into it and getting into it, 
to get the production value up, you've got to spend more time with transitions and yes. overlays and yep. the music and the audio levels and everything about it. And obviously getting the clips in the first place, playing yes. to get those clips in the first place, getting them <laughs> transferred over. It's all hoping, kind of hoping, concern. hoping you don't get a copyright claim on top of that. <laughs> God, yeah, God, yeah. It's one of the worst. Things. Capcom is one of the worst for that. Capcom is one Ca of the Nintendo worst. Nintendo is the, the ni Nintendo ninjas. That's why I don't do any Nintendo content because yeah. the snipers are out and they will get you. Oh, God, yeah, God, yeah. <laughs> well, they've. I mean, they even last year it was uh, one of the biggest Nintendo YouTubers that was on there. Forgotten the name of the guy now. Long hair. You probably know him. Yes, um, or at least I've seen him. Um, but they, he was a partner with them for for years, and they just decided to stop the partnership with them. Yeah, no reason. It's, Nintendo is weird like that. Like they're 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 weird. Yeah, it was like I don't understand. But they, but they didn't. They kind of half stopped it. They were like, oh, we're still going to send you stuff, but you're not won't work with us anymore. He was like, wow, that makes no sense. <laughs> so, so why are you sending it over? He's like, you can't have anything Nintendo related on your channel you can't like in terms of like visuals or anything yeah you can't do any you of that they, 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 the they immediately strike you for that can't use the colors he was like okay i don't know why <laughs> but it's such a strange thing but yeah this it's all video production you've got to be careful on what you're putting out as well as how much time you're putting into it and yep. the music you're using trying to find good uh, rightly free music to use, of course, unless you call Eastwood and then you design your own. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he's got skills for days, dude. I and mean, that's why RDX is so good. I mean, they have yeah. a really strong panel, but I think individually, when you look at the, it's a master class of individuals on that show. That's why they have 3,000 people watching. I mean, you look at what Dealer does individually. Uh, yeah. You look what D Batch does. Obviously, you know Tim Dog. You know is is a staple in the community. You know, of course, uh, you know there's it's, it's you have Colt Eastwood. Um, yeah. um, I'm, I know I'm forgetting a couple of people. My God, um, Zalker eighty seven. That that's an, a that kid exploded on the scene. Uh, you know, very very talented. Uh, you know, Jay Fonzarelli. You know, when he puts his videos out there, I mean, they have an incredible talented crew. Oh God, yeah. God, I've, uh, thankfully I've been on once. I don't think at that point where I was only just starting on the podcast scene, so I don't think it was the best. But it was uh, it was an experience nonetheless. Hey, listen, but, you know what? It's 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 how we learn, bro. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Just isn't it? Just that's only the one thing. And you you'll probably say the same when you get people on. The one thing I always tell people when they come on to the podcast for the first time, or if they've never podcasted and they're coming on as guests, is just relax and think as it. Is as if you're talking to your friends or yes. just in a party. Ignore if you want to, just ignore the live chat. <laughs> just pretend they're not there and just talk to us. That's all, all you've got to think about. The yep. rest comes the rest comes naturally after that. Yeah, you know what it is? That's a great way to look at it. Because I know I, I know I get message a lot because my DM is open. You know, I always tell people if you have questions and you you know, first of all, there's always an open invite for my show. I yeah. love showcasing new talent because I I, I enjoy paying it forward. I think that more, uh, uh, you know, YouTubers should do that. And again, I, I I understand that it's a business. At the end of the day, people are not going to push your content uh, above theirs because you know they don't want you to you know take views away from their content, which I don't think actually happens. But uh, yeah, it, I, that's the best advice. Just just be yourself, man. Be, be who you are in real life. Don't make a a persona just to be on the air. Again, with me, what you see is what you get. This is how yeah. I was in uniform. This is how, how I'm out of uniform. It's it, this is what this is Mr. Boomstick, folks. This is this is I, I love I love the community. I love gaming. I love helping others. And uh, I that's the best advice you could do. That's a great that's a great point. Just be yourself. Yeah, be yourself. Ignore ignore that side chat at least for the first few times because as you know managing podcasts, it is so difficult especially when you've got to you've got to start the topics you've got to keep an eye on your own guys and listen to them yep you've got to manage the chat put the chats on screen when you want to then you've got obviously when the higher you get you get super chats and you've got to control the super chats right okay yes. start talking about that <laughs> you know it's funny believe it or not room, it's like a control room a really different yes it, it is but you know here's the funny thing here here's something that this is a deep cut folks uh, uh, I, I, how I learned to do all of what I'm doing now, not the production level, that that I literally 
just stumbled into. I learned on the fly, making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. Yeah. But how I control my show is, believe it or not, was taught to me by the NYPD. Because when you are in uniform and you are an active, I was very active. Like I went to every gun run. I went to back every unit because, you know, at the end of the day, you want to sign out and go home. Right. So you, I was, I, I listen, my wife, my, my wife jokingly calls me Captain America. I want to help everybody. That's how I am. But in, in, you know, I, I had an incredible, the last half of my career, I had an incredible partner um, and uh, she, she didn't like to drive. Which is great because I enjoy driving. So I drove all the time. <laughs> yeah. But also, because I was, you know, the senior guy in the car, I took, you know, memo book entries. I, t I answered the radio. You know, you obviously you're driving. You're listening to the, the calls coming in. And all of that, be doing all, have, being in control of all of that, believe it or not, really taught me how to control the shows that I do. Cause like you said, you got, I got the scroll on the bottom. You got to constantly change, especially if you're using like, you know, uh, stream yards, you know, you got the super chats coming in, you got guests, you got to you got to read the topics. I'm reading off a teleprompter. So all of the stuff that goes on that people don't see now I have gameplay cause I've got a better computer. So gameplay, you know, and you gotta, you gotta quickly switch it over to something else. It, it, it's, I, I love the challenge of it. I think that's what drives me to continue to do so much. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. The challenge, challenge is definitely one thing. That's that's one word for it at times, <laughs> especially especially when you start. I mean, when you've got your regular panel members, it's quite easy because you're quite used to it then. But when you yeah. start, especially like when I've had like 10 person podcasts, Oof. the management there. That is but, outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> I have a hard time with seven to 10. Yeah. Holy cow. Ten. Well, that's uh, when I had um, who was it? It was Chris Grinnell, the Iron Lords. Um, who else? I think I might have had Cole Eastwood and and Tim Dog all on at the same wow. time. Wow, that's a powerful, like, powerful panel. Holy cow! <laughs> well, that was a that was hard to manage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. a lot of big voices there as well. So it was a lot of just sitting back and letting them just go for the floor. <laughs> What's the topic? Fire away. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's absolutely awesome. One, one, uh, one curiosity that I've got about the about your channel, uh, Boom, is uh, Double Barrel. Where was Double Barrel Gaming? Where did that come from? What was its origin? The, very simply, my love of Evil Dead. Uh, th that that's my 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 favorite film of uh, of like all time is Evil Dead Two. I watched it a hundred times. Um, and obviously, Ash, uh, the, the, yeah. the 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 you know the hero or the you know the end, uh, the protagonist of the of the mo of the film, uh, yeah. always carried a boomstick. So you know, this is my boomstick. You know what I'm saying? So what wind up happening is, you know, it's funny, and I'm going to transition into how I came up with some of the names of the shows. You know, uh, d Double Barrel Gaming came from my love of Evil Dead. That That is, you know, I figured, okay, Double Barrel, I, I, I like Ash. Let me see if I can incorporate this. Let me see if anyone has this name. And there are, there are some close ones, you yeah. know, but there's no Double Barrel Gaming. So I wind up locking that in in September of 2017. I started my channel. I actually didn't put content on it until November 3rd was my first welcome to Double Barrel Gaming. But... Like, for instance, uh, you know, I have Breakfast with Boom, which is on uh, a Friday mornings. I have the Xbox Factor podcast on Thursday afternoons and Primetime Gaming on uh, Monday evenings. And the newest one is Xbox One on One, which is on Tuesdays at noon. And each one of those names came in the most unusual, ridiculous way you could ever imagine. Breakfast with Boom came from I was I was trying to like you know figure out what my own show was going to be and I'm like well you know I can't go Friday night because of Mooch obviously I don't want to challenge Crossfire so I'm going to do a morning show cuz I'm retired so I can do that I was in Stop and Shop sh food shopping I was I, I was I, I was I know, I, I it was early in the morning. I dropped off my wife. I always go early to food shopping because there's no crowd. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. I gotta have breakfast. I'm like, breakfast, breakfast, breakfast at boom. 
wait a second. I, and I kept saying it to myself, breakfast or boom. And I said, this is it. So I, you know, I text myself the name so I don't forget, <laughs> right? Um, Primetime Gaming came from, believe it or not, I was downstairs doing the laundry. And I'm like, yeah, I, I want to do something at night. You know, I had left, I had left, left Crossfire to return the Friday nights to my wife. Like we used to go out, we used to go food, you know, go shopping or watch a film or just stay home and get takeout and watch a movie. And I had done Crossfire for two years and I, and she didn't complain that one, not, not one time. Um, so I was like, you know what? I, I, I kind of want to do my own thing, but I also want to return Friday nights back to the missus. So I wound up leaving Crossfire full time. I, you know, I guessed every now and again, and I yeah. wanted to do my own show. And I remember, I remember doing the laundry. I'm like, man, I got to do something at night, something that's prime, something that's prime time. And I'm like, wait a second, prime time gaming. This is awesome. I wrote, I text myself again so I wouldn't forget. And the Xbox Factor podcast. Again, it's the craziest thing. I come up with these names when I'm doing housework. I was doing, <laughs> I was cleaning my, the, 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 the house, the apartment. And I'm like, I want to do an Xbox show because I'm such a big the Xbox. And, so, so, you know, so, and I, I kept playing with different names. And, and finally, while I was cleaning, I said, the Xbox Factor podcast. And I'm like, wait a second. That, holy shit, that sounds great. So th this is, believe it or not, that's how all of the names came from doing housework <laughs> or chores. It's crazy. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, I didn't obviously Evil Dead. Uh, I didn't didn't really picture that being where Double Barrel come from. I thought it was maybe he's, uh, from law enforcement, the love of a gun, or something like that. You know what, dude? Yeah, yeah, that that you know, and a lot. I've actually had a lot of people ask me that. Like, I'm not. I I, I obviously have my firearm still. I'm not yeah. a big gun enthusiast. It's it's. Listen, I can tell you this. I, I in, in 21 years as a New York City police officer, I never fired my my service weapon once. Uh, what, not even one time, good. not even by accident. <laughs> and and that's, that is a good thing. It, uh, it's a grateful that you didn't need to. Yes. Yeah. Now, have I pulled it uh, on certain, you know, oper you know, certain situations? Sure. Though I never found myself wanting to, you know, to, to pull the trigger. So yeah, it's it that actually came from my love of the movie, never my love of actual guns. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. 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 Uh, and last but not least, the final topic for today is. Where do you see the future of your channel going and what have you got planned for the channel? You know, look, I, I'm going to tell you this. Um, I had an explosive 2020. Uh, I came into that year uh, with 3,200 subs. Uh, and I had I had been doing at that point uh, my own channel for two years, and yeah. it's you know some some sometimes you get a little disappointed because the numbers they, they fluctuate, they go up, they go down. You get subs, you get people unsub, whatever. Last year, I I my I had set a goal for myself is my goal coming into twenty twenty was to hit five thousand subs. That was what yeah. I had put in front of me, and I think it's really. It's really good to, as a content creator, to set reachable goals. Like everyone wants to get a hundred thousand subs. Who doesn't want that plaque from yeah. from, from YouTube that says you're a hundred thousand winner, right? Who doesn't want that? But for me, I always like to put goals that I know that are somewhat attainable. Uh, that you know, so my mine was to hit uh, uh, five thousand. And I wound up hitting before the new year seventy one hundred uh, total subs. Which was much much larger, two thousand plus subs than I thought I was going to get. And uh, this year, I had set a goal. My 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 ultimate goal is to get ten k, and I'm yeah. twenty six hundred subs away from that. Um, and I and I think it's a very reachable goal. I I don't know. I mean, believe it or not. And again, I I think that because I'm a little older, uh, as great as having a YouTube channel is for me. My ultimate thought and theory was to eventually get hired by Microsoft as a community yeah. manager or even to, to work at Redmond in, in some form or fashion. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have friends at Redmond. I've had, uh, I've had um, uh, Larry Herb on the show last year. Yes, yes he did. That was an uh, awesome, I, I, awesome moment for you as yeah, well. Yeah, it, big deal. When Microsoft reaches out to you and asks you, hey – we love what you do with the Xbox Factor podcast. 
we were thinking about getting Larry Herb on the show. Would you like for him to guest? Uh, yeah, I nearly fell over on my chair. Of course I want Larry Herb on my show. Um, and uh, so, I mean, again, could it still happen? Sure, sure, it could still happen. Uh, is it is it likely? Probably not. I'm I'm 50. You know what I'm saying? I've had my career uh, in, in in law enforcement. I've retired. Now I'm I'm just doing something that I love doing, and yeah. uh, you know it's it's I'm going to continue to grind. I'm up to four live shows a week, which is a lot of work, and I'm and I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining at all. But I I just hope that I do hit the tent. That for me the, the ultimate. Uh, crossing the finish line moment is when I can say that my channel that I created from scratch with literally no help from anyone, I was able to get to 10,000 subs. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly, exactly it. And again, it's, it's just down to your sheer hard work. And I think you're what really shines through for yourself, Boom. And uh, this is just from my own experience and my own watching yourself is, is your sheer enthusiasm, not just in oh, thank you. A, a Xbox, but just in general. It's such an enthusiastic guy, such a positive guy for the community. Um, and you never, you never get involved in all that drama. And that really, nah. it's, it's, it's great to see because a lot of people end up getting caught up in that. And, it really shines through on yourself. Such an awesome I appreciate guy, that's, awesome that's extremely kind of you to say. I appreciate the uh, the observation. Like I said, I, this is who I am, folks. What, what this is? You, if you wanted boomstick raw, you got it. Uh, there, there's <laughs> there's no uh, you know the loud voice or the excitement behind uh, you know a Spider Man game or a new Resident Evil game. It, it, it's it, this is this is just me. I, I love gaming. But you know what I love more than even gaming is the community. The the, yeah. the the amount of people that I have met since starting this channel has been nothing short of just incredible. And and being and actually having people that come to your show and are there each and every time is still like like I got to pinch myself. Like it it's still amazing to me that people enjoy what I, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, the content that I produce and that, and that's why I take this stuff like super serious. Like I feel a, a tremendous responsibility to, you know, to keep up my end of the bargain by new, you know, having new content each, every week and, and being positive isn't uh, a choice. That's just who I am. I just like being positive. It's it, as you know, and you've seen in this community, it's real easy to get caught up in nonsense Oh, so yeah. I, I make it my business to not even, when I see stuff like that, I kind of just, you know, I steer in the other direction. <laughs> That's no, it's exactly, and, and it's, it's the gen. It's just genuinely who you are as well. And it's like I say, it's awesome to see. Um, and it really shines through on, on your content and on your podcasts. And Thank every time you. you see it. Thank you. Um, such an awesome, awesome show, awesome channel you've got going. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure having you on as the first guest. for uh, this is this Yeah, this show. is awesome, dude. I had a great time. Thank you. <laughs> That's no problem. Uh, and again, I hope everybody else who tuned in um, enjoyed the first uh, of many uh, in this series of Get Know Your Creator. Uh, and this was Mr. Boomstick XL. If you would like to let people know where they can find you, your channels and your social handles, and uh, we'll close this down. Yes, it was super easy. Uh, at Mr. Boomstick XL on Twitter, my DMs are always open. I answer everyone. Uh, at least I definitely I try to for sure. Uh, no question is a dumb question. If you are someone that wants to learn about how to start a channel, hit me up. I was, you know, I'll send you all the links to what is, you know, what I bought, where, you know, where I got my equipment from, how I learned, and uh, for, show, folks, listen. If you want lots of live content that has uh, fun in it, uh, positivity, uh, and and you're into, you know, long big shows, I have four of them. I have primetime gaming on Monday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is a multi uh, multi plat uh, uh, podcast. I have Xbox One on One, which is a new show I started. We're now going into week number six of that. That's on Tuesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Wednesdays, I take off to, for myself to actually play games because I still enjoy doing that. <laughs> yeah. and, th and Thursday is the Xbox Factor podcast at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is, of course, an Xbox show. And then Friday mornings, 
uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Breakfast with Boom, another multi-plat podcast with rotating uh, guests. Um, and uh, if you're interested, check out Double Barrel Gaming on YouTube. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. And once again, thank you very much for being the first guest on the show. And I uh, can't wait to, uh, to jump on Double Barrel and uh, jump back on Breakfast with Boom again sometime. Absolutely, brother. You got you got a golden ticket. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, thank you everybody who uh, came out to watch this first episode. Uh, this will be up to patrons first. Of course, as a massive thank you for for the extra support you you provide to ourselves on uh, on keeping the channel running uh, and the content that we create. Um, and then it will go out a little bit later on to the rest of you. So I hope you enjoy the first one and I hope you enjoy the rest of the series. Thank you very much. Have Thank a good you. night. Have a great night.